Well, now I'd like to turn to uh, David Woodhead for some of his modeling. Uh, Dave's been here uh, several times before, and uh, it's it's an enjoyable experience for me. So, David, welcome. Yeah, hi. How are you doing? Good. Everything good here. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about photography, um, and I just want to touch on some simple ideas about that. Um, I will share my screen. I will just launch right into that. And uh, there we go. Dave, I'm, I yep. apologize for interrupting. Just for those who are new, and I see there's quite a few, uh, don't forget, hit the chat button and you'll see lots of things happening in the chat. Oh, that's correct. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to full screen here for me. Uh, so I'm in slideshow mode. So um, is everybody seeing that okay and hearing me? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Um, so I've got two things I want to cover. And these are both pretty simple. My, these are my takes on what I can do with photography and, and, and what, what I find really useful. Um, and I'm going to split that into two halves. I call it documenting and conjuring. And documenting um, is basically um, what you've got on your workbench is like a progress on something. Um, and conjuring is when you look at your, your layout, something on your layout that you want to convey uh, a feeling of the place, a uh, bit of geography and history, you know, get into the more layered aspects of, of our modeling. So here's some of the, here's a couple of basics I want to touch on before we get into anything too specific. And that uh, you can do a lot with an iPhone now or any other, uh, you know, um, a little device, um, but I use a, a camera. My camera here, I've got, there's two in the picture. Um, these are Canons. Uh, they're basically like point and shoots on steroids. Like these are, they're not SLRs. There's nothing, they're nothing that fancy. They're not cheap either. Although I have a friend, Larry McDonald, who does great stuff with, with a much more inexpensive camera. But um, mine, the one on the right is uh, a G5X. That's hmm, maybe two years old now. And the other one is a G15. Um, I also had a G12 at one point years ago. And um, they're all really great in that they, are, they do everything pretty much that an SLR will do except uh, change lens. So they're, um, their features are great. Their, their colors are, are wonderfully rendered and uh, all the automatic stuff is great. But um, I have to say that most of the time I'm shooting models, I'm in manual mode and that's a really important thing. And that's something that is really hard to achieve uh, without getting you know, too technical on, a, on, a, on a, uh, an iPhone or any um, camera device like that. Um, I just flip it into manual mode and I have complete control over my upstop, um, my ISO, my speed, my, and my, um, uh, you know, everything that I need is, is right at my, my, uh, my thumb, on my thumb and my fingers. Um, the important, most important thing in modeling is a high F-stop. So you want the smallest aperture, the most depth of field. Um, a lot of digital cameras go to F8 and that's pretty good. Uh, one of the reasons that I like these cameras is that they go to F11. So that's a pretty significant uh, jump up in depth of field. Um, now, uh, the, the way I use it, here, here it is for a tripod, I use a low, I can use a low ISO, a low speed, and maybe a, a bit better in terms of the noise and the grain of the picture. I don't actually notice that much difference between the low ISO and, and when I go handheld, which I shoot most of my pictures on that you're going to see in a few minutes. Um, I'm using uh, like 1600 ISO or more. And for my purposes, that's been great. Uh, it enables me to be mobile. I don't have to think about maneuvering my tripod. I can just handheld the camera and uh, set it at a speed about 15th or a 30th or faster and still have my F11 for depth of field. So, um, Here's part one, documenting. So what we're gonna do is we're telling a story. Um, I keep my camera, camera in the room all the time, pretty much. I always have my camera when I'm working. It's maybe not on the workbench, but it's not far away. And um, 
this is a good thing. Here, think of, think of the before picture while you're working on it. So in other words, during a build, like take, take a look at what you're doing from time to time. And when you make a significant little bit of progress, shoot that, put it on your workbench and shoot it. You know, like, uh, you know often <laughs> if we won't be able to see the, the, uh, the, the methods and the techniques uh, after you're finished your, your model. Um, try to explain as much as possible in the image. Absolutely. And I'll give you a couple examples of that. Clarity is everything. Yes, sir. -y. Um, this is a little example picture here. I think I showed this a little while ago. This is a good example of storytelling um, in, in a nutshell. And uh, I used this picture that we're looking at to explain where I was coming from in my layout concept. So here's a whole bunch of books that I used as reference on uh, narrow gauge in the, um, in the Eastern part of the continent. Uh, so here's my main workbench. And the main thing to note here is those two lights, those two blue lights, they're just from Ikea, they're nothing too special. And I've got some, um, some nice bulbs in, in them. They're, um, hmm, I can't think of what they are right now. I did change them out for, uh, what you want is a nice high CRI, a sort of a daylight bulb that, um, that won't color your, uh, your models too much. So here you can see the various things on my workbench, but when I've done something, what I do is I put down a, a sheet of paper. In this case, it's just an eight and a half 11 on a clipboard. I put my model on there and I move those lights around until I can find an angle with my camera that, is, that is, doesn't have too many shadows in it. That's something that to look out for. I mean, a shadow is not terrible, but it is nice to eliminate it and make it, not make it too obvious. And having these mobile lights is really great. So I can get a picture like this. Um, that's handheld uh, using F11 for the depth of field. And you saw how big those cylinders are on the workbench, right? So looking back here, there, that's a, a O scale standard gauge uh, set of cylinders. And um, so uh, they're just sitting there on the eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Uh, if I have something bigger, I do have some other paper that I can use, um, some uh, newsprint and a couple of other background sheets that I can move in for bigger objects. So here's the cylinders in place, still on the same piece of paper. Um, they're just, just a way of illustrating uh, the progress on this model. Here's another thing. There's the sheet of paper in the background, but, but what I'm doing here is I'm illustrating a technique. So I'm, you, have, you can see my soldering jig at the bottom. I'm soldering uh, brake beams onto a, um, a set of uh, Proto 48 trucks from uh, right away. And uh, so what I intended with this picture was to tell the story of how I'm doing that. So uh, you can see my resistance soldering uh, a little rig down here. And a pair of tweezers, of course, over here, um, which I posed there, of course, just to show that that's part of the technique of moving around these uh, pieces of phosphor bronze wire that I'm soldering to the bolster. And these um, uh, brake beams are going to be positioned onto those. So that's the story I'm telling in that picture. And here's the finished trucks. Uh, in this case, they're sitting on some graph paper. That's another thing to consider at times. So that's just quarter inch graph paper, which is, uh, makes another nice background. Uh, you can lay out models. This is uh, you know, progress in painting, another model. And um, here's, the, here's another story. This is how I was making some handrails. So what I've got is my jig up here, and I'm just using these um, sort of oversized spikes to hold my pieces in place. I've got the angles cut here. This is how I was making my stairs. I used gun blue to color my brass wire. And I used this honking big um, uh, soldering gun to solder things together. So I didn't actually show the solder and the flux, but you get the idea of what I'm doing right away by looking at this picture. Okay, now, now part two, conjuring. Now this is where we get, this is sort of the more artistic side if you wanna say that, but it, it can also, uh, it, it's, it's different way, you're telling a different story here. And so one thing to do, and I do this from time to time, I just get my camera and I walk around the layout as if I've never seen it before. Wow, look at this layout in this guy's basement. And I'm looking for subjects, angles, stuff as if um, I, I was a visitor to my own layout and 
just wanted to uh, look at look for some cool things to shoot with my camera as if I was a little person or as if I was just another uh, model railroader visiting my basement. Um, for the for realistic shots, of course, keep the camera low. You can you can do some nice um, sort of uh, high level shots too. Don't rule those out. But uh, most of the effective shots that make people go, "Ooh, wow!" They're mostly taken from an eye level for a scale person. Uh, try some angles from the side and rear. Um, one thing that we're often aware of in pictures is that we're looking at it from the aisle, and. There are times that, 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 I, that I, I want, want to disguise that. So I put my camera somewhere far into the layout and my camera has one of those little foldouts in the back that you can move the screen around and look at it from the side. And that's kind of handy for that. Um, the story, yes, most pictures will have a story, even if it's just something like, you know, the switcher is switching the um, uh, mill or whatever's going on. Um, and of course, once you look at your photos, you often discover things and uh, you, you find things that the way, ways to improve your modeling. And that's a whole other topic of, of just sort of, I guess it's remedial photography. You know, you take a picture of your model and you go, oh God, I put on, I put the cab on that locomotive crooked. I never noticed that. And that those are the kinds of things you discover. And the process of shooting, uh, while you got your camera and looking at your layout, you can, you have the luxury in this digital age of shooting looking at the screen and then saying, oh, you know, what if it was just a little higher? Or what if that locomotive was just a little farther forward so that it wasn't obscured by something in the foreground? Or you can take a slightly different angle to reveal something or hide something uh, in your shot. Then of course there's, uh, you know, perfecting your exposure for, um, um, you know, lighter or darker or uh, whatever you like there. So here's, here's a nice example of, um, I like the composition of this. I like what it conjures. This conjures North country. There's a bunch of junk under a building up on stones. Um, the, the motion, the lines in the picture lead you to that locomotive. So you can see how the straight lines of the, the painted side of the building direct your eye. It's like an arrow going, oh, there's a locomotive there right in the middle and the stairs leads you up to it so that it really sucks you into this little scene. Now let's just, um, this is one of my favorite of my photographs, just in terms of where it takes me in my mind. Um, this, this one's an example of depth of field. I, I got this pretty good considering I'm not using a Helicon Focus or any of the other um, processing. Uh, like that, you can do that, and I certainly recommend those products, um, in, which, uh, in which you shoot several pictures at different focus points and then combine them using the program, using the app. Uh, those are great. I haven't used them. Um, this is not bad. I'm a little out of focus on the rails in the very foreground in, on, over on the right, uh, but I really got this nicely, I thought. Um, and I do that by just experimenting. I use autofocus and I just let the camera focus on somewhere around here, like the front of the locomotive or that the, the front of this flat car. And uh, usually that, that kind of depth will average it out so that you get nice front to back focus using F11, of course. Here's a little bit of a lighting uh, trick. Uh, you, many of you probably know this, but um, basically I'm just holding my eight and a half by 11, by 11 sheet of paper to get a little bit of light onto that um, gone here, that air dump car. So here's the before picture. So I just shot that this earlier today to illustrate this. Um, here we go. This is the before, this is after. And um, it's amazing how the, just that single sheet of paper uh, fills in the light under the car. Like you can see the brake detail. You can see um, like there's a cool thing happening. Just gonna go back. There's even a cool thing happening with the windows in the building. Like they light up as if they're re reflecting the sky behind me or something like that. So a nice little trick, uh, definitely my lights, as you can see uh, earlier here. Uh, this is right at the front of my layout. And the, uh, I use fluorescent tubes like high CRI, um, like, um, you know, daylight tubes, um, 
the, it's not just color temperature, but you, you want the, that high CRI. But this lighting is another whole topic. But, um, but unfortunately, they're, they're pretty much right above the front of the layout. So they shine straight down. That's why I get this kind of effect at the front. Now here's, a, here's something that I really like to explore is uh, in terms of conjuring. Here's one of my favorite pictures. Uh, this is the Newport and Sherman's Valley. Um, it's in that book, uh, Nargage in the Sherman's Valley. And it's their engine house. And I just love the, the grainy look and the, um, the, the texture and feel of this black and white. And you can get that uh, by sucking the color out. Uh, of course, I'm using Photoshop and, and we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, but uh, I used, um, I, you can do that even in preview in, on a Mac. Uh, you don't need anything too fancy. You can just desaturate your, your photograph and take all the color out of it and then uh, fiddle around with the contrast until you get a little bit more of that extra contrast look that they have in those old photographs. Uh, here's a here's a shot looking up like I'm breaking some of the rules here I put the locomotive at the top of the picture with just the fields and the goldenrod and stuff in the front and uh, I did put that uh, background in in Photoshop uh, here's the um, here's the original picture which is not bad I mean really it's just sort of a, uh, a sky in the background that's fine uh, my sky and my layout is just a blue background very plain no clouds and then I had this picture from uh, Banff, uh, Banff, Alberta, uh, with the mountains in the background. So if, you, if I go go back, I just put this. I combined them there. That especially because it's a Colorado locomotive, I wanted a little bit more mountainous scenery than I actually have in my layout. So here's an example. Um, here's here's the brutal truth of looking down uh, the track here, and you can see the ceiling. It's pretty darned obvious, but they, I like the composition of the shot from side to side. Um, and, um, you know, it's a, a, an ore train doing some switching there, coming in uh, in front of the station. So uh, I just cropped it so that I, did, I didn't change the background here at all. Um, all that is, is just cropped it, but keeping the proportion um, and to make a pleasing picture without that nasty ceiling detail in it. I went, I did go farther in this and did a sky and some desaturation of the color. I didn't go completely black and white. I just sucked some of the color out so that it looked like a kind of washed out sunny day, like uh, one of those hot, slightly hazy kind of days. I just wanted to convey that. And I have a sky and a choice in there that conveys that as well, tells that story, gives you that feeling of weather. Here's another example of this. This is uh, the original picture. Um, which is not bad until it's uh, until itself. You can sort of see the corner in the background. And uh, so I did replace the sky first, and then I sucked the color almost completely out. It's not completely out as you can see that the wagon is still a bit green, um, but I just enjoy what this picture says. And again, I sort of broke some composition rules here. Kind of all the items of interest are over there on the left and the tracks lead you to those items of interest. There's even a locomotive hiding back there behind the station. And the only thing on the right that's other than the tracks is that one guy sitting there. And, and uh, you might take you a while to notice him, but he's there and it provides you a little bit of balance in the composition of this picture. I also really like the, um, uh, the way that the ground slopes down. There's a bit of junk, but there's a bit of clutter, but all it is is just a couple of things. It's not, you know, it's, uh, it conveys the scene. Uh, here's another one. Uh, I kind of like this picture. This was taken before I had a lot of the scenery done in this area and uh, kind of brutal on the sky. So I replaced the sky. But uh, and again, I found a sky that seemed to um, suit the modeling. Um, here's another uh, evocative picture. There's not even a train in this picture, but I just really like the look of the foliage and the graininess and uh, that of this picture. Uh, and here's what I did with one of my photographs to sort of replicate that. So this is uh, on my layout, my ON3 layout. And uh, so I sucked the color out and did, did a little contrast work. And uh, I also did some film grain. Uh, Photoshop has a nice, um, um, in the filters, there's, uh, if you go into the filters, you can find a nice film grain thing, not to overdo it, but it does look something like you'd see in one of the books 
like the Pennsylvania logging series. That's the kind of looking at, look I'm going for here. And that's it. That covers it for tonight. Um, I'm going to put a link in uh, the chat um, if you're interested in, in a really in-depth, um, really great uh, clinic on photography. Uh, the National Narrow Gauge uh, Group, a um, uh, guy named Ken Ellers, I think his name is, E-H-L-E-R-S. Um, um, he has a great clinic, a two-parter on their series. I can, I'll put a link in, in the chat. Um, and that's about it. I, I'll, the only thing I can add is that I love Photoshop and I'm not afraid to endorse it. It's, uh, it's about a hundred bucks to buy the elements version, which is all you need. Uh, you don't need to do the sort of uh, monthly payment thing on the other versions. The elements has everything you need, the layers, the, and the filters and all that kind of stuff. But that's, you know, I don't want to uh, uh, get uh, too caught up in all that. Anyway, thanks for listening. Um, for someone who's a novice photographer uh, and would be maybe asking for uh, their first digital camera other than phone for Christmas with maybe a <laughs> $100 to $150 limit, is there anything in that range that you could recommend that would be good for learning on? I, you know, I've, I haven't really researched uh, the camera market. I mean, I sort of got my favorite. Unfortunately, it's not in that range, but <laughs> um, uh, Larry McDonald, you, are you there? Uh, what's your little yeah. red camera? Uh, the little camera is just a, a little Sony. Yeah. And, and, you know, kind of a sure shot. I can go fetch it. But, uh, oh, okay. So it's, it's, I've got one of those little digital, uh, but I don't know how much manual mode it has. Can I, I don't know if I can set f-stops and stuff in it. Can I, can I make a comment about those inexpensive cameras that might be helpful? Uh -huh. Yeah. So a, a neat trick you can do with those is you don't, you often on the less expensive cameras, you don't have complete control over the f-stop. Mm -hmm. But if you put the camera, and this seems counterintuitive, but try it, that's what I mean. If you put the camera at maximum zoom and then put it as far away from your subject as you can, it will force the camera into a higher f-stop than you can uh -huh. get even in manual mode. It's just, oh, and, yeah. and I have, I learned that with the little Sony, you know, uh, sort of cigarette pack shaped camera. And it works remarkably well for getting the f-stop way up. I've, I've done that with mine as well. Uh, you do get that sort of telephoto foreshortening um, uh, if you do it in the extreme uh, so that things look kind of flattened uh, in a way uh, if, if you yeah. do it too much. But, but um, it, it does provide some relief if you just move the camera back and uh, then either just crop your picture uh, in whatever, uh, however you're doing that. Mm -hmm. You can even crop pictures in, the, in your phone, I think, uh, you know, those pictures. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that's a very good tip. It's to just okay. move back and then either uh, zoom in uh, from your new location or else crop. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've got one of those Canon power shots, I guess. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I'll play around with that.